Amen. Amen. Well, back to the book of Daniel chapter 12. And we move into Daniel chapter 12 and verses 5 to 13. If you'd turn there in your copy of God's Word. Daniel chapter 12 and verses 5 to 13. Last time in verses 1 to 4 of Daniel 12, we entered into the ending of Daniel's final prophecy. This prophecy began back in Daniel chapter 10 continued through chapter 11, and now concludes for us in chapter 12 with the discussion of the Great Tribulation. In chapter 12, Daniel is being addressed directly by the angel Gabriel. We elaborated in Daniel chapter 10 repeatedly and the beginning of chapter 11 confirming That it is Gabriel who is speaking to Daniel. And in our verses that we've already looked at in verses 1 to 4, Gabriel announces two powerful elements beginning in verse 1. The first, that the archangel Michael, who is Israel's special emissary during the tribulation, will be there to assist. A tremendous encouragement and recognition that Michael, the arguably the strongest and most powerful of the angelic realm, is the one whom God has ordained to be the special agent for the nation of Israel, and particularly in their most severe trial, which they will be facing. Second, we see Gabriel tell Michael that the people of Israel will be rescued. This is a national restoration and eliminates the errant perspective that the church has forever replaced Israel. Israel does have, always has had, always will have a national redemptive plan in God's purposes. And those who say otherwise, as much as we love them, are errant in their perspective. And do not rightly understand the text of Daniel, the text of Ezekiel, the text of Isaiah, the text of Revelation, the text of 1 Thessalonians. And they make unfortunate and sad errors in their interpretation of those texts in order to support their theological presupposition. Beloved, don't ever be that way. Never allow your theology to drive your understanding of God's Word. That is completely inverted. God's word must drive and inform and correct and modify your theology. Yours and mine. Because this is a perfect inerrant word from a perfect and holy God. And we don't get every detail of it. In fact, we saw last week that that's exactly what Daniel tells us in Daniel chapter 12. Some of this stuff is sealed and concealed and will not come forward. And I think that's in my notes somewhere, so I better get back to that. So we also see that this is a huge military effort that's ongoing, that's being discussed here. And that which we addressed from Revelation chapter 12. And by military, I mean we're talking about those elements we saw back in Daniel chapter 10, where the angelic realm, the realm, the righteous and holy angelic realm, will be waging war against Satan and the fallen wicked angels, just as Revelation 12 speaks about. Then in verse 2, we confirmed the pivotal concept of eternal life through resurrection. That is eternal life both of believers and of unbelievers. The eternal life of a believer will be that in which they are raised to eternal life to live forever in God's pleasant presence and glory. For the unbeliever, they will be raised to eternal life to be put into eternal torment where they are given eternal bodies to endure the eternal suffering of isolation in darkness and in continual burning with fire 
and the consummation of their flesh with, by worms, which then regenerates so more consummation by more worms and more burning can occur throughout all eternity. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't think of anything much more horrific than that. You know, many of, our, many of the people in our world have this perspective that, oh, you know, it's okay. I don't need to accept Christ because if he sends me to hell, that's just fine. Because I'll be there with all my friends. No, you won't. Your friends will be in hell that don't know Christ, but you will not be with them. You'll be in complete isolation. And it's horrifying to consider that situation. And in that verse 2, the terms sleeping and awakening signify death and resurrection. We know that the moment a person dies, for the believer, they are immediately transmitted in their immortal soul and spirit to the presence of God in a conscious existence to live with Him until the time of the resurrection where their physical bodies are changed from the decayed immortal flesh, mortal flesh rather, to an immortal flesh that they will dwell in for all eternity. For the unbeliever at death, their soul and spirit immediately enter into a conscious existence of torment and at the resurrection at the great white throne for the unbeliever, their bodies will be raised from the decayed and destroyed mortal flesh to an immortal flesh ready for eternal punishment apart from God. And that's what the text is telling us. And, and, and this is stunning revelation. And some would say, oh, that's just, you know, you're misinterpreting Daniel chapter 12 and verses 1 to 2. Well, let's go take a look at John chapter 5 and verses 25 to 32. Because they say the same thing. We don't need to hear it twice in the Bible. One time is enough. It's what it says. We believe it. We hold to it. But when it tells us it to us twice, and in both Testaments, rest assured, that's what God's speaking about. And we discussed last time the multiple resurrections from Scripture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Revelation 20 and verse 4. Revelation 20 and verse 11, three separate resurrections, the final being the great white throne in Revelation 20, 11, and we didn't yet address because of the, the depth of the discussion, Matthew 27 and 52. So there are multiple resurrections that will occur. And we see them described in various ways throughout Scripture. And as a result, verse 3 tells us that these from Israel who possess saving faith during the end times will boldly profess and draw others to Christ, to their eternal reward like shining stars, and that there will be various radiance based on the faithfulness of those. And that's just what we see in the, the New Testament, beloved, regarding our faithfulness and why it is such a joy to consider carrying forth the, the work that God has called us to do in proclaiming Jesus and in being faithful in our walk because that is the gift that he has given to us and, and who is a God like that? Who is a God who gives us work to do foreordains that we would walk in these good works gives us the strength and ability to carry forth those good works that he has foreordained and then rewards us as if we had some participation in it. This is the glory of our incredible heavenly father. Daniel is told in verse 4 to seal up both this final prophecy and his book, thus indicating that some of these details will not be known until the great tribulation arrives. Hence my comments about our theology and understanding scripture. The revelation that Daniel gave was full and complete, understandable and precise. It became more understandable when Zechariah gave his vision about 20 to 50 years after Daniel. 
Because there were many more details. And you'll see tonight, and uh, during the summer break, I'd ask you to be reading some of the different prophetic books of the Bible, Joel and Amos and Ezekiel and Isaiah and Zechariah. And I'm going to tell you again, don't walk away from our study in Daniel without going back and reading Zechariah. I, I, I've been reading it on my own. I, in fact, I got pulled into it today and I started, I, there was a couple things in Zechariah 1 I wanted to look at and I started down that road and next thing I know I'm grabbing a commentary on Zechariah and then I'm looking up some cross references and I'm like, wait a minute, you got a message you got to get finished, back on track. But go read Zechariah. Fantastic. And after Zechariah's revelation was full, then Jesus Christ came. And then there was more, massively more revelation. And then the apostles began to teach and to write. And we had Paul writing 1 Thessalonians. And we got so much more. And then 2 Thessalonians. And then finally with the apostle John in the book of Revelation. And we've continued to get more information. But it's not complete. We know a lot about this from all of that additional revelation. But we don't know it all yet. And there's more to come. And it's fantastic to recognize all of it. And all of this, like the entire last prophecy in Daniel, and the entire book of Daniel, is pointing to Jesus Christ and the necessary proclamation and exaltation of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And all of the scriptures that we talked about last week, and there were a bunch of them, and I, I hope you wrote them down, because it's a fabulous study, confirm those details. And this brings us to our final section of Daniel and our title tonight, which I've titled, How Do You Know? How Do You Know? Daniel was majorly vexed and perplexed at the beginning of this prophecy in Daniel chapter 10. Do you remember that? He couldn't speak. He had no strength. He couldn't even get off the ground repeatedly. He is absolutely out of it. He, is, he, he can't understand. He can't, can't grasp the extreme judgment that's coming upon his nation. He's recognized a ways back about the conclusion of the 70 years of judgment that was prophesied in Jeremiah 25 and verse 10. That that was coming to a close. And he's excited about that and he's praying. He's fervently praying. This is the situation around Daniel in the lion's den. And he's not going to stop praying because he knows this is coming. And then all of a sudden we get into the second half. Into these prophetic visions. These future visions of Daniel. And we have the 70 weeks of Daniel chapter 9. Where now the judgment of my people is not going to be for 70 years, but instead it's going to be for another 494 years. And it's clearly indicated to Daniel that there's going to be some break between the 69th and the 70th week. That he's unsure of how long it is. And frankly, so are we unsure of how long it is because it's still ongoing. But that just is crushing to him. Now we're going to have all this more judgment. My nation will continue to be judged. And then, if that's not enough, then he gets this vision in Daniel chapter 10 that tells him that his people are going to continue in judgment and it's going to continue to escalate and it's going to go all the way to the end times. They're in all the way through recorded time. And Daniel can't take it. He doesn't understand it. He doesn't have the strength to endure it. And he's overwhelmed by all of this. And now, as we recognize all of these details that are part of this title, we come to the idea of our, of our theme, which is four aspects of the great tribulation to solidify your confidence. Four aspects of the great tribulation to solidify your confidence. And it's so important that we understand as we, as we come to this title, how do you know? Because this was Daniel's question. He's overwhelmed. And, he, and he's like, I don't know what to do with this. 
We, we all have that, right? I mean, we've all had those kind of events in our lives. Um, my mom was here this last weekend for, for Resurrection Sunday, and it was so great to have her here. And she is talking about when my brother left. My brother was killed at 19 years old. And, and her response is, he left because it's so hard for her. You know, when we found out that my stepmom has inoperable metastasized pancreatic cancer, we're, what do you do with that? What do you do with that? Right? Well, this is Daniel, only way bigger on steroids. And he doesn't know what to do with it. And so, how do you know? And this is the response to that very situation. Let's look at our text beginning in verse 5 of Daniel 12. Follow along in your copy of God's Word as I read, please. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others were standing, one on this bank of the river and the other on that bank of the river. And one said to the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river, how long will it be until the end of these wonders? I heard the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river. As he raised his right and his left toward heaven, his, raised his right hand and his left toward heaven, and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. And as soon as they finished shattering the power of the holy people, all these events will be completed. As for me, I heard but could not understand. So I said, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end time. Many will be purged, purified, and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand. But those who have insight will understand. From the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. How blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1,335 days. But as for you, go your way to the end, then you will enter into the rest, into rest and rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the age. Our first point, a question of personification. A question of personification, which begins in verse 5. And here note that in this, the first element of personification is the change in person. Gabriel has been speaking all the way since the ending section of chapter 10, which is the majority of chapter 10 all the way through chapter 11 and through the first four verses of chapter 12, and now we have a change in speaker. Now our author, Daniel, writes, then I, Daniel. So we have a change in personification to begin with. And the further question of, of personification arises regarding the three other individuals in verses 5 to 6. Two standing and one dressed in linen. So who are they? Let's first consider the man dressed in linen. Turn back to Daniel chapter 10 with me. Back to Daniel chapter 10 and verse 1. Daniel 10 and 1. And we read there, Daniel 10 and 1, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel who was named Belteshazzar, and the message was true and one of great conflict. But he understood the message and had an understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, had been mourning for three weeks. I did not eat any tasty food, nor did meat or wine enter my mouth, nor did I use any ointment at all until the entire three weeks were completed. On the 24th day of the first month, while I was by the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen, whose waist was girded with a belt of Pure gold of Uphaz. His body also was like beryl. His face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. His arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze. And the sound of his words like the sound of a tumult. What 
an incredible peace. I, Daniel, alone saw the vision while the men who were with me did not see the vision. Nevertheless, great dread fell on them and they ran away and hid themselves. And I was left alone and saw this great vision, yet no strength was left in me for my natural color turned to a deathly pallor and I retained no strength. But I heard the sound of his words and as soon as I heard the sound of his words, I fell into a deep sleep on my face with my face to the ground." Daniel encounters the pre-incarnate Christ in visual form. We went back and we went through this. We go to Revelation 1 and this is a perfect illustration of this. Some who may argue that this is not the pre-incarnate Christ are completely missing the picture of who this is about. That the man in linen is the Lord. It is the second person of the Trinity. And it is the same man in linen that Daniel now encounters in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5. By the way, that same man is also the picture that's further elaborated on in Revelation 19. And you can go and look at those texts. The second of four in this final section of future prophecies from chapters 7 to 12, that is the second prophecy of four. Recognize we had one in chapter 7, one in 8, one in 9, and now the fourth and final in chapters 10 through 12. Four prophecies in the final futuristic section of Daniel. And now in this fourth and final prophecy, we see this incredible aspect of Jesus meeting again with Daniel. Now let's look at, uh, at one other text. Look at Daniel chapter 8. Back a couple more pages. Daniel chapter 8. And we want to take a look at verse 15. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 15. Daniel 8 is a different vision. It is the second of four again in this final prophetic text of 7 through 12. And chapter 8 focuses on media and Persia and Greece and is a precursor to this, our last vision in chapters 10 to 12. Look at Daniel 8 and 15. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, standing before me was one who looked like a man. And I heard the voice of a man between the banks of Uli. And he called out and said, Gabriel, give this man an understanding of the vision. So he came near to where I was standing, and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, Son of man, understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end. The man whom Daniel sees and the voice that speaks is also the pre-incarnate Christ. So let's consider this for a moment. Where are you if you are between the banks of a river? Where are you if you are between the banks of the Boise River? You're in the river. Excellent. That's right. Or you're above the river. Now, I don't know about you. I've not done any walking on water recently and probably not going at any time in the future. Worked for Peter for a short bit. But this clearly is one who is then above the those banks of the river. And if you're God, you're above it. And we see the Lord above the river speaking with Gabriel. And these further verses that we just looked at, 10.1 describe the man in linen, and 8.15 to 17 show us the same situation that Daniel was experiencing in that first vision, although different, but the same type of environment and the same setting, if you will. So we see the Lord above the river speaking with Gabriel. And we have the man in linen above the river as the Lord Jesus Christ. The river, although not critical, is the great river, the Tigris. We know that because of the context. Chapters 10 to 12 are one prophecy. Same issue, so same location. And again, not a critical issue, not a hill to die on, but almost certainly different from the Uli from chapter 8. And the one angel is almost certainly Gabriel, our speaker through most of the vision. And it is also likely that the other one on the other bank is Michael. 
the archangel. We, we need not be dogmatic about the identity of the two angels, although the man in linen is and must be recognized as the Lord Jesus Christ. Thus, we've answered a question of personification. That is the change in person to Daniel and who the three individuals are. And that leads us to our second point and our second question, which I've titled a question of prolongation. A question of prolongation. It begins with the question in the middle of verse 6 of Daniel 12. How long will it be until the end of these wonders? How long will it be until the end of these wonders? Here we have this, this man speaking and oh, the one on the riverbanks, we don't know which one, but one of the two angels is speaking to the pre-incarnate Christ who is above the river and asking, how long will it be until the end of these wonders? The emphasis is on the last Hebrew word of verse 6, translated as wonders in the New American Standard, that is. It's also translated well as marvels or astonishing things. And it means, as Tanner notes, things that are incredible, hard to imagine, hard to believe. How long? And the question is not when they will occur. That is already answered that the end is the end times. And specifically the great tribulation. It's rather how long will they last? It is a question of prolongation. How long are these things going to go on? And in verse 7, the man in linen, the pre-incarnate Christ, answers... But prior to the answer, we see him raising his right hand and his left toward heaven. Well, what is going on here? We know sometimes that raising the hands is indicated of prayer. Is that it here? No, it's not. Because the end of the verse shows us that it is a statement that the man in linen that Christ makes to answer one of the angel's questions in verse 6. That is how long. And right after the hand raising of the pre-incarnate Christ. We're told what he's doing. Notice what it says in verse 7. And, uh, and he raised his right hand and his left toward heaven. And swore by him who lives forever. And swore by him who lives forever. So he's making an oath. This is exactly what we see in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse, verses 39 to 40. Listen to those verses. Deuteronomy 32 and 39 to 40. Here in the song of Moses we see the reflection of Moses describing God. Deuteronomy 32, 39. See now that I, I am he, and there is no God beside me. It is I who put to death and give life. I have wounded and it is I who heal. And there is no one who can deliver from my hand. Indeed, I lift up my hand to heaven and say as I live forever. Notice the identical parallel to God who we recognize here as the pre-incarnate Christ raising one hand to heaven and swearing by one who lives forever. The raising of both hands in our text is significant and shows even greater emphasis. And as Francis Driver notes, it is a more complete guarantee of the truth of what is about to be affirmed. Not one hand, but two. A further affirmation that what this one is saying, this one dressed in linen, this one who is God, who is the pre-incarnate Christ, that his statement is affirmed in a yet greater way by this oath which he is making and swearing. And his swearing is by him who lives forever. It is an oath founded on God. 
and in the immortality that exists in him alone. Listen to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 16. 1 Timothy 6 and 16 reads, I'm going to back up to 15 for context, which he brings about at the proper time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and here it is, verse 16, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion, amen. Now God the Father, God who is spirit, is being referenced as the one who is immortal, who alone is immortal. Now this, of course, includes the entire Godhead, coexistent and co-eternal, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, as our distinctives class revealed, and if you've not been there for a while, I'll look forward to seeing you at our next go-round. But we're seeing that he is referencing God the Father, the only immortal one. We will live eternally. We will become immortal. But we are not eternally immortal. We do not and have not existed since before the beginning of time. Only God. And thus this oath that is taken is sworn by him who is immortal and eternal for all time. Walverd notes the key parallel here to Revelation chapter 10. Listen to Revelation chapter 10 and verses 1 through 7. Revelation 10 and 1. I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. And he had in his right hand a little book, which was open. He placed his right foot on the sea and his left hand on the land, and he cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices." When the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write and I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken and do not write them. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever who created heaven and the things in it and the earth and the things in it and the sea and the things in it, and there will be delay no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished as he preached to his servants, the prophets. We see the identical conception of this mighty one raising his hand and swearing by God who lives forever, forever and ever, ever. By the way, when we often talk about prophecy in the book of Revelation, we think of three sevens, don't we? We think of the first three sevens, which are the seal judgments, the second three sevens, which are the trumpet judgments, and then we jump to the last three sevens, which are the bold judgments. Do you realize there's a fourth and we just read it? There are seven thunder judgments. But John is told to seal them up and not tell us what they are. Seals, trumpets, thunders, bowls, all four. But the same parallel aspect of this raising the hand and of this swearing to God. And as for the confirmation of the prolongation, it is at the end of verse 7. Time, times, and half a time. Time, singular, one year. Times, plural, two years. And half a time, half a year. Combining for three and a half years. The identical time frame given to the little horn in Daniel 7.25, who is Antichrist. This is the, also the identical time frame from Revelation 12.14. This is equal to 42 months. I know you all love my math, so here we go. Get your pencils ready. Three and a half years, 42 months, we all got that. Also, 1,260 days. That's going to become super important when we get to the end of this section. 1,260 days. We see the 42 months in Revelation 13.5, specifically Revelate 42 months, and also in Revelation 11.2-3. 
we see it in Re Revelation 12, 6 for the 1260 days with 30 day months. And this further details the coming of the end, which we see at the end of chapter 7. And he raised his right hand and his left toward heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. And as soon as they finished shattering the power of the holy people, all these events will be completed. The holy people are a reference to the Jewish people. This is the same phrase used in Daniel 8.24. Identical Hebrew phrase. And also we see this same phrase used to describe the Jewish people in Deuteronomy 7.6. In Exodus 19.6. For those of you coming to our Old Testament survey class. We just covered Deuteronomy last week. Not too late if you're not there. Come on down, second hour. And we saw that, ex that Deuteronomy, or excuse me, Exodus 19 and 20 are the Mosaic Covenant. Exodus 19 is the preparation for the covenant. Exodus 20 is the Ten Commandments. And also we see the same phrase for the holy people in Isaiah 63 and 18. Isaiah 63, 18. And it's true that there will be many Gentile martyrs during the tribulation. And in the context, that's what's being spoken about. But these are not the Gentile martyrs. These are the holy people. These are the Jewish martyrs that will be killed during this time. Revelation 6 and the fifth seal is all about the tribulation martyrs and primarily focuses on the Gentile martyrs. And Daniel 8.24 re references both the Jewish and the Gentile martyrs. Let me just show you where that, how we see that in Daniel 8 and 24. It says, His power will be mighty, but not by His own power, this is Antichrist. And he will destroy to an extraordinary degree. This is the martyrdom of people. And prosper and perform his will. He will destroy and note mighty men and holy people. Gentiles and Jewish faithful. So as we recognize this martyrdom that Antichrist is going to bring forward. The and most interestingly, the Hebrew phrase shows this isn't the destruction of the Jewish people. Notice what it says in our text in verse 7. It is, they finish shattering the power of the holy people. But they're shattering of just the power. Literally in Hebrew, to translate this phrase, we would translate it as to finish, to smash the hand of of the people of holiness. You see in your New American Standard, there's a footnote that shows you that, that word power is well translated as hand. So it isn't that the people are being cut off, but it is taking and it is smashing that, which they would use for the strength and power and to feed themselves. This is why most of the translations use the word power to translate this particular Hebrew word. But it is the crushing of the hand or the crushing of the power, not the people. Very, very important to recognize. God allows this in His providence and sovereignty. And it is because, as commentator Wood notes, the power and self-sufficiency of the Jewish nation needed to be shattered so that they would receive Jesus as their Messiah and Christ and their King. As Tanner notes, the positive side of this and the purpose of the oath is that it will be limited to three and a half years. This is just what we've previously read from Matthew chapter 24. And we read in Matthew 24 and in the Olivet Discourse section, which is, again, such an important part of our text. Matthew 24 and 22, 
unless those days, speaking about the great tribulation as we've discussed, unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. This is just as, again, we've previously discussed. Well, now we know exactly how long time, times, and half a time, three and a half years, 42 months, 1260 days, and why it must be this way as sworn by God Himself. And we've answered our second question with a question of prolongation. And this leads us to our third point, a question of persistence in verses 8 to 10, where it says, as for me, I heard, but could not understand. So I said, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? He said, go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end time. Many will be purged, purified, and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand But those who have insight will understand a question of persistence. Daniel was persistent in his questioning as he didn't understand. And as for your understanding, you're going to have to be persistent also. And we'll return next week to answer the question of persistence. I want to close by sharing one commentator's thoughts on all of this section from verses 5 through 7. I think it's so important, and I want to I read it to you because I believe it's so impactful. And one commentator writes, One of the purposes of the Great Tribulation, and you might take notes if you are, get these scripture references because they're so important. One of the purposes of the Great Tribulation though not the only purpose, is to humble the Jewish people, especially in the latter half of Daniel's 70th week, i.e. the final three and one half years. There will be immense suffering for them. Once the Antichrist puts an end to sacrifice in offering for Daniel 9.27 and proclaims himself as God per 2 Thessalonians 2.4, Elsewhere, the Bible refers to this as the time of Jacob's distress, Jeremiah 37. And Zechariah 13, 8 to 9, Zechariah 13, 8 to 9, indicates the majority of the people perish during this time, with only one third surviving this ordeal. Yet in the end, the Lord will save the surviving remnant once they Look to him whom they have pierced. Zechariah 12.10 and what we studied with our pastor on Resurrection Sunday. He goes on. Zechariah goes on to say, They will call on my name and I will answer them. And I will say, They are my people. And they will say, The Lord is my God. Zechariah 13.9 The time, times, and half a time will be the period of greatest suffering that the Jewish people have ever experienced. Daniel 12.1 Yet it will be brought to an end by Christ's personal return. The one with uplifted arms by the river announcing the length of the great tribulation surely ought to be the one who knows. For he is the very one who will bring it to an end. How horrific to consider, beloved, with all that the Jewish nation has gone through, that the Holocaust will pale in comparison to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Why was Daniel overwhelmed? Why couldn't he stand or speak? Because it was inconceivable. The worst times were yet ahead, particularly again with all that they've been through. But this will bring them back to Christ. And in the end, isn't that all that matters? When we're dealing with loved ones who have tremendous loss, who are facing tremendous loss, isn't the only thing that matters that they know the Lord Jesus Christ? What a great confirmation these verses bring to us. 
What a great confidence in Scripture and in end times events. And yet what must be our resolve to share Christ? To go to those all about us, but particularly to recognize the need of the nation of the Jews. To go to the Jewish people and to proclaim to them their Messiah. That God might bring to them the understanding of who He is and reveal to them through the power of His Spirit the understanding of their Messiah and their Christ. Beloved, the book in Daniel is all about them. We have a role because God has blessed us for a time to be grafted in as those untimely born. But we must be faithful. For Romans 11 tells us that if we are not, we can just as easily be broken off as they were broken off. So may we embrace this gift. May we embrace the understanding of the depth of that which lies before us, which by God's grace we will be removed from because of the rapture of the church, but which those of the Jewish nation that yet still are in hard-hearted rebellion against their Christ, that they will go through. And as horrific as all of these things are, and they're like nothing ever before nor since of the greatest judgment of God, make no mistake, those, those four judgments of Revelation are devastating. Even they pale alongside of the eternal torment in the lake of fire and hell. And you, my friends, you have been given the word of life. Let it flow from you as it has been poured in, that God might use it for His glory. Amen? Father, thank you for the gift of your word. It is precious beyond measure to us. Father, it is our word. It is that which we desire to eat to take deeply into us and that it would continue to exude its life-giving power through you and through your Holy Spirit. Strengthen us to the role you've called us to. Help us to grow in faithfulness. Use us, Lord, in every venue that you might take us to. Help us to put aside our fear of man in worrying about being rejected or mocked or scorned for speaking your holy name. And Lord, be pleased through our efforts, weak as they may be, to bring souls to yourself. For your glory, for your honor, we pray in your holy name, dear Lord. Amen.